Miss. Miss Elizabeth. Hello. Oh, this is wonderful. Well, come dance with me, Mr. Dwight. I don't dance. Come on, let's go. Why? What could be better than this? How about Paris? Paris? How I don't understand. How could we get there? That's where that airship's going, but if you want to stay and dance, we can... No, let's go. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's go right now. When I think the term wasted potential, Bioshock Infinite is one of the first games to pop to mind. It has a fascinating setting with incredible art direction and atmosphere. It has great world building and makes use of a unique time frame not often seen in games. And yet, its ho-hum shooter gameplay is a few steps back from the first Bioshock. It's a major step back from what Bioshock 2 did with its gameplay. It has interesting subject matter, but doesn't really know what to say with it. It lacks the focus that Bioshock did with its subject matter. Toss in the concept of multiverses and you end up with a plot that's a jumbled mess. The more you think about it, the more it starts to fall apart. Promise that Columbia shows get swept away in the second half to focus on this idea of multiverses. It's offset partially by the great world building and the dynamic between Elizabeth and Booker. And yet, this dynamic between Elizabeth and Booker, most of it was already done in Bioshock 2, and in many ways, Bioshock 2 did it better. Bioshock Infinite is one of the more noticeable examples of what was shown to the public prior to its release and how different it was from the end product that ended up being. In some other universe, the game we saw prior to launch released. Four score and seven years ago. Keep looking, Lincoln. Like the first Bioshock, Infinite was propped up by the media as something pointing to games as art or an important title. While I could see the merits of that for the first game, the way they propped Infinite as this important title is confounding considering what the final product is. It's also a great case of looking at what happens when you don't really have any deadlines, restrictions, or budget issues and you could do what you want for years. This is an exception and not the norm in the industry. Most games face unchanging deadlines and restrictions that are far too short. However, there's something said to having an end goal and date in mind to work forward towards. Bioshock Infinite is very much a case of a game demonstrating that Orson Welles quote that the enemy of art is the absence of constraints. From piecing together what's been said over the years and what happened behind the scenes, the final version of what we got was mostly cobbled together in the last year or so prior to release. Many have said that there was enough cut content here to release a handful of games. Of course, many games go through this iteration, but Infinite is a really big example of it. Now, I know that Infinite holds a special place in the hearts of many, but I've noticed that time hasn't exactly been kind to it. There are those at release who point out its flaws, but were mostly swept away. However, over time, that tune has changed. Thankfully, time has been much more kind to Bioshock 2. I've always had very mixed feelings about Infinite. This is my first time replaying it since the release of Burial at Sea Part 2 back in 2014. There's still a lot here to admire and respect about Infinite. It's ambitious, but ends up being a Frankenstein of ideas that lacks focus. There was really something special here, and that's what makes Infinite such a fascinating game to look back on. A few things before we begin. Once again, a big thank you to Dustin Marbles for doing the animated intro to this video. She also did the animated intro for my video on the first Bioshock. The algorithm recommended me her fantastic animated Bioshock 2 video. Go check out her work card here and link in the description and pinned comment below. This video is only covering the base game of Infinite. I'll be doing a separate video on the Burial at Sea DLCs at a later date. There will be spoilers throughout, along with the other two Bioshock titles, but I'll let you know when they show up. To note where I'm coming from, I view Bioshock 2 as the best in the series overall, with Infinite as the weakest. I ran a couple polls to get a gauge on how people feel about these three titles. The first poll, with around 4,600 votes, had just over half voting the first Bioshock as their favorite. Bioshock 2 and Infinite were tied. A few comments pointed out I should have made separate entries for the DLCs, so I did another poll without the first Bioshock. I also included Minerva's Den and Burial at Sea as options. With around 3,200 votes, the base game of Bioshock 2 was the winner. On how the game came together, Bioshock Infinite was given the luxury that few games were able to do at that time. Producers 2K gave the team at Irrational the choice of whatever they wanted to work on. 2K Merid would work on Bioshock 2. Creative director Ken Levine had nothing to do with Bioshock 2 at all. They didn't have to worry about budgets or schedules to begin with. So as a result, the first stretch of development had very little structure. They decided to continue with the world of Bioshock, but take the story outside of Rapture. The success of Bioshock turned Ken Levine into one of those figures in the industry like a Kojima, a name you could put on a title to help sell. Throughout the video, I'm going to cover more on the behind the scenes at the respective sections. There's plenty to be said about this game, prior and after launch on design decisions and how the game shifted throughout its rocky development. Infinite starts off in 1912 on the coast of Maine, where being rowed by a couple of oddball rowers. These are the Lutest twins. That's Bastila from Knights of the Old Republic and Lady Shepard as the lady here. I'm 
made it very clear that I don't believe in the exercise. We're playing as Booker DeWitt. Unlike the first Bioshock, he's a voice character. We have a picture of a girl to be brought back unharmed as we approach this lighthouse. Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. Unlike the first game, we actually get to see the face of our protagonist here. Good luck with that, pal. Of course, that's also him on the cover art. Rather than descending the lighthouse like in Bioshock, we ascend here. And then we get this whole card bit that's become a bit of a meme. Wait a minute, that card. One of my favorite shit posts called The Average Bioshock Player makes fun of this bit. Check out the card here if you want to watch it, it's a good laugh. You know, I've always wondered what the point of this part was. There are other bits with Infinite that they do have some meta commentary on games just like the first Bioshock. This one though, I've never really been sure what they're trying to say with it. Taking the seat, we get launched up into the sky, into the city of Columbia. This is very reminiscent of the intro to Bioshock. Hallelujah. where the scientists would not be bound by pity morality. When we make our landing, what we hear and see here shows that Columbia is going to be a very different place than Rapture. Even those who are more critical to the game than I am can more or less agree how great the setting of Columbia is here. I remember watching those initial reveals thinking, God damn it, they've done it again. It's funny how Columbia is a world of opposites when it comes to Rapture. Instead of a city in the sea, it's a city in the sky. Instead of a silent protagonist, we have a voice protagonist. Instead of coming to a city that's been torn apart, we come to a city on the brink of being torn apart. Like Bioshock, the city itself went through a few iterations. Initial plans were to be much more influenced by the Italian Renaissance. After seeing Assassin's Creed 2, they changed their mind. Earlier stages in development went with a darker Art Nouveau approach. This, however, looked too much like Rapture in the Sky. Eventually, the team would settle on the turn of the 20th century time frame, with the game taking place in 1912. Very much has that World Fair feeling to it, as the game took heavy influence from the 1893 World Fair. Unlike Rapture with its no gods, no kings, only man, Columbia is very much a world of God. It's a land of religion with Father Comstock as its prophet. It gives heavy reverence to the founding fathers of America. But there's a dark underbelly here of this land. Well, floating land that's separated from the US, but we'll get back to that later. The game still looks fantastic all these years later. This is the tail end of the seventh generation of consoles, a generation that loved its browns. The strong art direction is both similar yet different with what they did with Bioshock. It's still very much a Bioshock game, but something that also stands on its own. It's an incredibly realized setting. However, it does suffer from the later portions of the game shifting its focus away from it. While the early section of the game is very much on rails and a walking simulator, as far as walking simulators go, you can't really do much better than this. Upon entering, we're given a baptism to hammer in the religious aspects of Columbia. Brother, the only way to Columbia is through rebirth in the sweet waters of baptism. Will you be cleansed, brother? I baptize you in the name of our prophet, in the name of our founders, and the name of our Lord. <laughs> Being here is very much a World Fair, a Disney theme park. The day we arrive is the Columbia Raffle and Fair of 1912. The fair setting is used to great effect to convey plenty of exposition and even a bit of a tutorial with figures and shooting. If I told you a man could hoist a one-ton stallion straight into the air, would you believe me? Well, friends, I am here today to tell. Those are no flights of fancy. Those are no tall tales told behind the pool hall. No, sir, no, ma'am. Those are vigors I'm talking about. Bronco is just a dick. <laughs> Zipping around, spreading their lies and dissent. Fear not! I got just secure. Grab a shotgun and go to work. Oh, John. Say something, Sonny. What's a voxophone? What's a voxophone? Exactly that. A personal record of voice. Hey, just so we're clear, I'm not paying for this. Just a demonstration, sir. 
One thing I do appreciate here is that vast majority of this portion is optional. On repeated playthroughs, you could just run past everything. Is the exposition here a bit on the nose? Sure, but this game has a ton of ground to cover in regards to its setting. This isn't a 30 plus hour game we're playing here. The singing quartet is one of my favorite moments in the game. Firstly, they're singing God Only Knows by the Beach Boys, one of my favorite songs. God only knows what I'd be without you. Plus it's very much a what's going on here moment. The song itself was released in 1966, and we're in 1912, so there's some time shenanigans going on here. One of the better ways of exposition, Bioshock Infinite makes use of the kinetoscope. It's a great way of conveying the time frame in regards to technology. We'll find a whole batch here that helps flesh out the history of Columbia. As well, the tone they take helps convey the stances that Columbia takes on things. This is something that the series has always excelled at, and Infinite is no exception in regards to exposition. At this point we get to the first bit that had a bunch of red flags going off in my mind on a number of fronts in regards to the plot. In a world such as Columbia, there's a lot you have to do in regards to suspension of disbelief. The game does a great job of justifying its setting and world building, but when your main character comes across a sign warning of the false shepherd with the same mark on his hand, don't you think at the very least he should cover it up? In the game with the whole idea of terrors and multiverses causing major issues with the plot, this here is one of the larger issues. When you need the character to act like a fucking idiot to get the plot moving forward, something needs to be tweaked here. Another red flag shortly follows with the baseball scene. We've been warned by the Lutesses not to pick ball 77, which we do. We have an encounter with them shortly before this, with the coin toss always ending with heads. Tails. Told you. Hmm. I never find that as satisfying as I'd imagined. Chin up, there's always next time. I suppose there is. With the baseball toss, you don't get to throw it yourself. It's a button prompt. No matter what you do, the end result is the same. Well, at this very moment. There's a brief mention later depending on who you chose to throw it at. This is something that comes up throughout Infinite, the illusion of choice. There is some meta commentary here just as there was in Bioshock in regards to choice. But here it follows a lot more flat. It also feels like it needs to be there in order to be clever again because Bioshock did it. And from there we get into the world of combat. And we ain't letting no false shepherd into our flock. <laughs> Show them what we got planned, boys! While I did find it better than I remember, Combat in Infinite takes a number of steps back from Bioshock, and especially Bioshock 2. While shooting always felt a bit loose in prior titles, the amount of choice you had, the interacting systems, and the variety of environments and enemies kept things mostly enjoyable with the prior titles, especially Bioshock 2. Shooting here does feel more tight for better lack of a term, but there are some puzzling design decisions here made on the loadouts. One of the major changes here being the two weapon limit akin to Halo and Call of Duty, along with regenerating health. In my Bioshock video I felt like maybe there was just too many guns, so I felt here like they went with a bit of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and went with too little that you could carry. There's a decent variety of weapons here, and I really did enjoy the volley gun. I'm not against having a limited number of guns, I'm a big proponent of limited inventories with how much they could add to the decision making process of done right. That's why I love the Resident Evil series when they implemented it well. Dead Space I think had the right idea of swapping between up to four weapons. I know they would course correct this in the DLCs, but this is for the base game here we're covering. Besides that being the fact that that's what Call of Duty makes use of. That also led to recharging shields. We can't store health packs. They're used upon picking up. Same with Salts, aka the Eve of Bioshock Infinite. One of the major differences that came between the release between Bioshock and Infinite was the Call of Duty audience becoming a thing. Modern Warfare, which launched COD into its mega seller status, came out a few months after Bioshock. This felt like something they wanted to do in order to get that Call of Duty audience. Then we have the Vigors, the game's equivalent of Plasmids. 
Some of them interact okay with others, but they felt quite uninspired compared to Bioshock. There are a few cases of them having overlap in what they do. In Bioshock, there is much more distinction of those that focused on damage output or crowd control. Here, there are a few vigors that more or less do the same thing. For better lack of a term, things feel a lot more disjointed here in combat for Bioshock Infinite. When I felt the game really start to find its groove in regards to combat, where it starts to really click, it's the tail end of the game. It doesn't also help that the enemies are a major step down from these splicers in Rapture. Playing them blend together don't have anything really memorable about them compared to splicers. The handyman, akin to Big Daddy fights, felt like a big step down compared to those fights. In Bioshock, we always had the choice of dealing with them. Deciding on how we are going to take them down prior to fighting was one of the better aspects of Bioshock, but none of that exists here. Instead of trying to fix hacking, which 2K Marin did a great job of in Bioshock 2, they removed it altogether. All you need to do is cast possession on these turrets and they're under your control. One of the other major differences in Bioshock Infinite is its upgrade system. Everything here is either tied to money or infusions that you could find throughout the game. There is no atom or power to the people machines. Money will allow you to upgrade weapons and figures. I'm not sure why they cut the atom system altogether. Sure, the atom system for upgrade had issues, but removing it altogether instead of iterating on it feels like a great disappointment. In prior titles, we had to go of our way to get Adam, dealing with the big daddies and little sisters to get upgrades. Here, it's just a matter of finding money from shooting enemies and looting anything that's lootable. Now, on the note of looting, isn't it a bit odd at points to be rummaging through garbage? I can understand that Rapture trying to gather supplies by any means, but this is Columbia. Have some decency, Booker. In addition to Bioshock Infinite is the Skyhooks. They can be pretty fun to traverse, however they really feel underutilized, especially from what we saw from earlier previews. There are sections, especially later in the game, of combat arenas where Skyhooks are more in play, which does add a further layer of choice and further chaos. And these combat counters can be pretty fun, but as I said earlier, by the time that the game really seems to find its groove with combat, it's mostly over. The whole removal of the Big Daddy and Little Sister system without something in that level to replace it really feels like a step back. They didn't want to repeat Bioshock again, so they tried something different with a companion, with Elizabeth. So now let's shift the discussion to Elizabeth. Uh, hello. <laughs> hey! Knock it off! You stop it! Will you stop it? I'm not here to hurt you. Who are you? Elizabeth is one of the better successes of Infinite, even if her presence greatly differed from what was revealed prior to launch. She's become a very popular and well-loved character. Some of her fans are a bit more lewd than others. It shouldn't come as a surprise that Elizabeth went through many iterations. We're also at many points where the development team thought that she should be cut altogether. However, Ken Levine insisted that she not be cut, which was the right choice. Very early ideas had her as a mute with a very different look. This was during the Rapture in the Sky days of development. With the final version here, she's very much the Disney princess trope in appearance and personality. This trope works for a good reason. Look and personality was also used to help her stand out at a distance so she wouldn't get lost in a crowd. There's a lot of care put into her animations and voice acting. Where is that? I, I don't understand. How could we get there? That's where that airship's going, but if you want to stay and dance, we can... No, let's go! Come on, let's go! Come on, let's go right now! It's funny as Courtney Draper, who voiced her, hasn't done a ton of roles since, considering how Troy Baker became the next Nolan North after this where he started to pop up in everything. Although she was in Days Gone. I haven't played Days Gone, but I have seen this moment and she does have this funny line that amuses me. Here, you can have this one back, but only if you promise to ride me as much as you ride your bike. When recording, Ken Levine would collaborate with both of them to improvise dialogue and make changes as need be. Major beats being covered, but small tweaks are made. From what I understand, this is a fairly unusual process when it comes to game development. Now, it may be a bit odd that she's so outgoing after being locked away from others for so long, but hey, if we're going with the Disney princess trope where they're locked away in a tower, I can let it slide. The team put a lot of work into rooms throughout Infinite that Elizabeth would go check things out and comment on them. There's never a case of her getting stuck on something and you having to go find her. She'll warp around. It's noticeable points when she does, but never felt immersion breaking. Much better than Watson. In combat, you don't have to worry about her taking damage. And you know, I'm fine with that. I mean, Comstock wants her brought back, it's us who they want dead. When making Bioshock, the team mentioned that first little sisters were not invincible. It was common for them to get killed in combat with a big daddy frequently, so they did end up changing the lore to make them invincible. Throughout combat, she will provide a helping hand, tossing you coins, ammo, salt, health.
Being trapped in a tower with plenty of reading material, she's pretty crafty, like picking locks. Can you open this? Child's play. All yours. And of course, she can create tears, portals to other realities. From there, she could bring in turrets, weapons, health kits, and more. This does add a nice layer to combat, knowing your area. You can only bring up one tear at a time, so it's a good idea to know which tear does what and where it's located in the area. But outside of cutscenes, Elizabeth can receive no harm, and that's one of the disappointments of Infinite. She's a non-factor. Now, I did say earlier I was fine with her not being harmed in combat. So what do I mean here? Well, earlier in development, using tears would tire her out and injure her. Here, when you open a tear, you have a bit of a cooldown before you could close it before opening a different one. There are no long-term consequences. As well implemented as she could be in certain areas, there really need to be something more here, especially considering that there is no system equivalent to the Big Daddy and Little Sister. Maybe earlier on this is something they did have in mind. Doing research, it was hard to dig up more info on some of these initial ideas. Perhaps she could use tears to bring in other vigors or obtain upgrades, but in the meantime you had to hold off enemy hordes as she concentrated. They could have taken a page right from Bioshock 2's playbook here akin to holding off splicers while your little sister harvests Adam. Something like this could have been this game's choice of harvesting or rescuing little sisters, and they could have gone much further with it. One of the main criticisms of Bioshock received was how little difference there ends up being between rescuing or harvesting long term. Initially, they want to have rescuing little sisters have very little rewards compared to harvesting. However, the publishers balk at this due to the controversy it could potentially cause. But here, they could have gone away with something similar to that. Imagine if the game was very limited to giving you upgrades without making use of these tears. However, you had to protect Elizabeth to ensure that those tears could be open and would have an impact on her. If you did a poor job of protecting her, it would become harder to get those upgrades. Something along those lines really could have worked, and perhaps they did have something like this in mind in earlier stages of development. So to see them pull away from this and not have something that replaces the Big Daddy system is one of, if not the biggest letdown of Bioshock Infinite. Several times throughout this video, I've mentioned how the final product of Infinite was much different compared to what was shown prior. I typically don't do this for most of my videos beyond a few mentions. Well, Infinite has a very well-documented history of how much was cut. There's always a fascination, a forbidden fruit, if you will, about cut content. What makes Infinite so fascinating is just how much content was cut. A member of the team, Bill Gardner, mentioned in an interview that enough content was cut to make five or six full games. There's one part that jumps out at me in this interview where he says, a year later, the audience is not going to care and eventually you don't care. Well, that hasn't been the case with Infinite. I've seen many, many discussions over the years lamenting just how much was cut. Another example a few years prior to Infinite was Spore. Watching those demos a few years prior to its final launch was jarring in what was changed. Ubisoft has been guilty of this for many years. Look at how much Watch Dogs changed from its E3 2012 demonstration to its release. It shouldn't come as a surprise with these demos we saw for Infinite in 2010 and 2011 were highly scripted down to the point to when enemies fired a gun. At that time, AI was still very much in a barebone state. And that's common, the team hoped to deliver on that vision they had. What was shown during these times were running on high-end PCs, which is the norm. Of course, reality required the fact that they needed to also ship on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. By this point, these systems were getting pretty up there in age. Try as they could, it just didn't work out and cuts were required. Which leads me to wonder, was there ever any thought of ever switching development over to the PS4 and Xbox One? These systems launched in November 2013, eight months after the launch of Bioshock Infinite. It looks like dev kits to those systems were handed out in around 2012, so it would have been fairly late in development. And even if they made the shift toward these systems, would they even have enough firepower for what they were hoping to achieve? Would they have tried to make them system sellers by being available for launch or near launch? They had this creative freedom and time, but even then, perhaps the higher-ups who have been fairly flexible were getting a bit tested with their patience. Again, this is all speculation. The gaming industry changed in numerous ways between the launch of Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite. In some other universe, there's a Bioshock Infinite that released akin to what was shown back in 2010 and 2011. But back to reality and the game itself. Now that we have Elizabeth in tow, we're off to the Hall of Heroes. It's here where we get to explore more about the history of Booker DeWitt. Unlike the past two titles, Booker is voiced and not a mostly blank slate like Jack or Subject Delta. While he had done a bunch of voice acting roles in games for around a decade prior, it was the one-two punch of voicing Booker here and Joel in The Last of Us that shot Troy Baker into the limelight. He became like Nolan North where he was showing up everywhere. Fun fact, in that initial 2010 reveal, Booker was actually voiced by Stephen Russell, aka Garrett from Thief. Well, would you look at this? Booker has lived a bit of a hard life. He fought at the Battle of Wounded Knee. He was a Pinkerton agent. His wife died in childbirth. He became a drinker and gambled. He's heavily in debt. 
but he now has the chance to clear that, bring us the girl, and wipe away the debt. This does create an enjoyable dynamic between himself and Elizabeth. While he is standoffish at first, Booker begins to open up more to Elizabeth and coming to terms with his past. Elizabeth's carefree, naive nature gets stripped away as she learns about the reality of Columbia and her role in it. While they do chat with one another throughout their travels, it's paced so that these longer conversations aren't suddenly interrupted by combat. These are mostly kept to cutscenes or elevator rides. One thing that's always stuck with me is how Booker hits the elevator button. At the Hall of Heroes, Booker will run into Slay. Slay is a man he knew from his time at Wounded Knee. While Bioshock would cut many, many interesting enemy concepts, the motorized Patriot at least remained. This area takes a lot of influence from the Hall of Presidents. Sadly, there is no rapping Lincoln. This level covers plenty of ground with the plot. We get more insight into Booker and his time at Wounded Knee. We learn more about Comstock, his time at Wounded Knee, the Box Rebellion, and the embellishments of truth. Elizabeth learns that she is the seed of the Prophet, the daughter of Comstock. You're Comstock's daughter. No, I can't be. I, I can't. He wants you to follow in his footsteps. Well, I want a puppy, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna get one. The game here does a great job of weaving these together and expanding on them. Slate is taunting us throughout. It doesn't hurt that he has such a great voice. Voice actor here has done many roles over the years, but I best associate him with Joshua Graham from Fallout New Vegas. Now, he's coming for me. And when I'm gone, all that will be left is the lie. I have been baptized twice. Once in water, once in flame. Our journey takes us next to Finkton. We'll get to meet the Vox Populi face to face here with their leader, Daisy Fitzroy. In order to get our ship back to Lee, we have to go get them some guns. The Vox Populi, Latin for Voice of the People, is a revolutionary group here in Colombia. They stand for the common folk, the working class, the lower class. Our arrival in Colombia coincides with a time in which the city is on the brink of war. Finkton is the factory town of Colombia. It's owned by Jeremiah Fink, one of the wealthiest men in Colombia. That was him running the raffle at the beginning of the game. We get some commentary here in regards to working conditions. These were prominent and common at this point in the Industrial Revolution. Long hours, being a worker bee, being paid tokens that are only good at the company store. There's also time auctions here in regards to getting a job done in the shortest period of time. Six minutes and fifteen seconds! Six minutes and five! Five minutes fifty! I, I can do five and fifty! Five and fifty! I said five and fifty! Anyone know than five and fifty! Toll Porter goes for the worker in the blue shirt! Fink has been watching us and wants our help in dealing with the worker uprising and the Vox Populi. And it's at this point in the game that the plot collapses in on itself. The gunsmith that we're looking here to help arm the Vox Populi is dead. Dead? Is dead. What? How the hell did- I see heads. And I see tails. It's all a matter of perspective. Why are you following us? Who sent you? Comstock? Here, Elizabeth opens a tear, but instead of pulling something from that universe, we enter that universe. In this universe, the gunsmith is still alive, along with other changes. So, if that's the case, what's the point of getting guns for the Vox Populi? Who knows if that's even what they still want? Yet, for whatever reason, Booker and Elizabeth still go look for the gunsmith tools. To make matters worse, once we get to the tools, Booker and Elizabeth realize that there's no way they can bring them back in one trip. Booker even acknowledges this. Well, we sure as hell aren't going to be able to carry all this back to the shop. We didn't think this all the way through. Again, like the mark on the hand earlier, if you need to have your characters act like fucking idiots without good reason to move the plot forward, some rewrites are needed. Considering how much the game changed up to release, and especially how much seems to change in the last year or so, that line of Booker knowledge it feels like it was added late into the game when they were running out of time. Here we make another tear leap into another universe. In this Columbia, the Vox Populi revolution is in full swing. Booker was one of its leaders, but perished. Look at that poster. In this world, you're a hero. I remember I led the Vox. S Slate and I burned down the Hall of Heroes. And yet, Booker and Elizabeth still continue with this plan of getting the tools and getting their ship back. By the looks of things, the Vox Populi seem to be doing just fine in this universe. Let's back up a bit and talk about this universe hopping. Doing this, you've more or less set up your plot to fall apart. 
The amount of holes that you could poke at in regards to the plot start to pile up. The more you think about it, the worse it gets. If they kept it to pulling from tears but not entering them, things could have been much more manageable. Sure, you could still do ass pulls, both figuratively and literally, but things would be much more manageable compared to being able to hop universes. For example, I like how Albert Fink has used tears to plagiarize songs from other universes and time frames. There is one scrapped enemy concept known as the Merged. These were enemies who would be like splicers, those who expose themselves to too many tears. This would have them looking to other worlds or their other selves. So perhaps at some point universe hopping wasn't going to be a major thing, and seeing as how much of the plot falls apart as a result of it, it should have been kept that way. From here, Daisy is after us and kills Fink, and plans to kill Fink's son before Elizabeth kills Daisy herself. It's from here on that the plot of Infinite shifts mostly away from the city of Columbia to a more personal one and one about the tears. And that's fine. The problem is more or less everything that came before is mostly swept away. The prior two Bioshock games shifted to a more personal story as the games went on, but they still had a large focus on Rapture. The uprising, the Vox Populi, the founders and their nationalism, industrial working conditions, class warfare, this mostly all gets swept away. Fitzroy and the Vox Populi being a case of meet the new boss, same as the old boss, gets briefly mentioned, but nothing ever comes of it. When it comes down to it, the only difference between Comstock and Fitzroy is how you spell the name. Infinite brings up all these ideas, but doesn't really bother to say anything about them. If you're going to say something about it, then commit to it or don't do it at all. It gets even worse with the DLCs. I'll talk about this more on my Burial at Sea video, but there's a retcon with Fitzroy that pulls back even further from this idea of committing. In his video on Bioshock Infinite, Matthew Matosa said the following, You can't be politically correct and portray a story like this at the same time. Bioshock Infinite was released in 2013. This was during the rapid rise of political correctness that really began in the early 2010s. So if you're going to say something with these ideas, just go for it. Don't half-ass it. Commit or don't commit at all. Our ship gets destroyed by Songbird, so we're off to Comstock House. This brings us through downtown Emporia. While it does have the very annoying encounter with Lady Comstock, I found it the most enjoyable portion of the game. Combat really seems to find its groove here. Plenty of open spaces, tears, and skyhooks to use. I haven't mentioned it until now, but a good portion of Bioshock Infinite has linear, corridor-based level design. Now, there's nothing wrong with that kind of level design if done right. However, the past titles had more of a looping level design approach with some backtracking, so to have this happen here is a disappointment. That said, this section of the game breaks the mold and returns more to that level design of past titles. It's no wonder I found it more enjoyable than the other levels. It's too bad the rest of the game could have been more like this. Storm is kicking up. The city is being torn to pieces by the Vox Populi. The story has shifted back more to a personal level. Here we get to learn more about Lady Comstock and Elizabeth, and how Elizabeth is not their child. We learn more about the Lutes twins as well. I brought them up here and there throughout the video, but let's look more at them in further detail. These two serve as these goofy, godlike characters. They're watching us in the background and sometimes show up to chime in with some vague dialogue. I told you they'd come. No, you didn't. Right. I was going to tell you they'd come. But I didn't. But I don't. Are you sure that's right? Something tells me they're not exactly what they appear. I was going to have told you they'd come? No. The subjunctive? That's not the subjunctive. I don't think the syntax has been invented yet. In a nutshell, Rosalind's research in physics, funded by Comstock, allowed her to explore more into the world of alternate universes. Her work also helped bring Columbia to life. She creates a machine allowing for the access of tears. Her work led her to finding a male version of herself in another universe, her twin. Eventually, Comstock has their work sabotaged, at which point they could show up at any point they want and anywhere they want. I do enjoy them as characters. I really enjoy the accordion track that plays when we run into them. really adds to that feeling that something is off about them. Sadly, the game does over-explain in regards to their past, which takes away from some of the aspects of amused gods watching the background feel that they had going for them. While the fight with Lady Comstock is annoying, the sounds that she emits are quite unsettling. On our way to Comstock House, Songbird stops us and takes Elizabeth away. Songbird's purpose has been to keep Elizabeth imprisoned within her tower. He has shown up a few times throughout the game since chasing us. 
He's an unstoppable force. Learning from their mistake of Bioshock in the ending, there's never a boss fight with them. Yet, they somewhat wrote themselves into a corner here with Songbird. The way Songbird is portrayed, you'd think he'd show up at various points and you'd have to fend him off. Yet none of that happens in game, it's all through cutscenes. It's fine that we don't have an outright boss fight, but there was some interesting opportunities to have the option of running or fending him off. Something along the lines of a nemesis would have been really cool. Considering how much got cut from this game, this must have been an idea in the works at some point. We jump to another universe in which Elizabeth is now the leader of Columbia. This is a pretty creepy area due to the snowy atmosphere and the Boys of Silence. As interesting of an idea that the Boys of Silence are, they were greatly cut back from what was had in mind for them. They're essentially walking security cameras. Upon the first concept art, the team agreed that they needed to be major players in the game. Well, something changed along the way. This ends up being the only time we come across them, and it's just a stealth section. As unsettling as their screams are here, the initial scream was even more out there. <laughs> It is too bad, as Infinite greatly cuts back on the horror elements that Bioshock had. Having more of these would have really helped with creating more tense situations. Although there is one really good scare with them. Should be able to head downstairs and get to Elizabeth now. <laughs> It turns out Elizabeth has brought us to this universe, which takes place at the end of 1983 or beginning of 1984. Columbia is attacking New York City. Songbird has always stopped us before. Time rots everything, Booker. Even hope. Elizabeth gives us something here that we could use to finally deal with Songbird. It's a hell of a scene visually, although I have to wonder, how much does Columbia affect commercial aviation? Unlike Rapture, which was built in secret, Columbia wasn't. Having a flying city in the sky would cause some issues with flight patterns. We return to 1912 and free Elizabeth, who now wants to kill Comstock to ensure that future doesn't happen. I'm not going to let you kill him. Really? Fucker. What are you going to do to stop me? Not a damn thing. Because I'm gonna do it for you. You know, Booker, it looks like she has your power outmatch there. Why not make more use of it? We're in the last stretch here, making our way to Comstock's flagship. This is a very combat-heavy stretch. Combat areas are decent enough, with lots of room to navigate and skyhooks to navigate around quickly. There is no final boss here, instead a section of holding off hordes of enemies for a period of time. There's very much a, oh yeah, we still have to deal with the moment when the Vox Populi show up. We also have Control Songbird here to use against the fleet. That's cool in concept, although all this consists of is pointing at a target, hitting a key, and waiting for this cooldown. As well, this horde portion, nowhere near as good as protecting the little sisters in Bioshock 2. That was one of the key features of the game, with plenty of care given to it. Here, it's just a one-time thing. That said, it's better than the Fontaine fight that ended Bioshock, but that's not exactly saying much. Before this horde combat section begins, we do deal with Comstock face to face before we put him six feet under. So while Comstock is an interesting antagonist, he gets shuffled around at times as never such a presence like Andrew Ryan. Unlike Ryan with his no gods, no kings, only man, Comstock is a man of God. His prophecies have come from the extensive use of tears. There's nothing really memorable about our face-to-face -face encounter with him compared to Andrew Ryan. Granted, it's not played up to be a huge moment, or at least it doesn't come across that way. There's no big plot revelation as there was with Ryan. Huh? Did you get what you wanted? Booker. Tell me! Booker. Tell me! It is finished. Booker. Nothing is finished! Booker. You lock her up for her whole life! Booker. You cut off her finger and you put it on me! Booker, stop it! Ugh. You killed him. While I did enjoy listening to his voxophones to learn about his ideas and thoughts throughout the game, he just doesn't quite grab the attention like Ryan did. Granted, there we're playing as a silent protagonist, a mostly blank slate with a companion who would chime in every once in a while on the radio. There is much more focus on Ryan in Bioshock. Here, Comstock gets shuffled away for good portions of the game. And now on to the ending. Oh boy, this ending. With our enemies defeated, we take down the tower and Elizabeth's powers are fully unleashed. In a very fan service moment, Elizabeth takes us to Rapture as Songbird drowns. The team mentioned that they always did plan to get back to Rapture. This does set up for the return to Rapture and burial at sea, but that's a video for another day. City at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> Ridiculous. What follows is a very visually pleasing scene of these lighthouses, an infinite amount of doors in different universes. We swim in different oceans, but land on the same shore. 
For some interesting cut content, there are other kinds of lighthouses as well, along with what looks to be Citadel Station. We go through some time frames of Booker's past. After Wounded Knee, he seeks forgiveness through baptism, but changes his mind at the last minute. To pay his debts, Anna gives his daughter away Anna to Robert Lutess. It's actually Comstock who has come for his daughter Anna. Going back through the tear, Anna's pinky is cut off upon the tear closing. Elizabeth is Booker's daughter. When the Lutesses come to get Booker 20 years later, the tear is muck with his memory. You see? He's starting to put his story together. What? You're quite fond of this theory of yours. He's manufacturing new memories from his old ones. Well, the brain adapts. I should know. I lived it. Returning to the baptism, in other universes, Booker goes through with the baptism and becomes Comstock. The reason Comstock comes through a tear to get Anna, or Elizabeth from Booker, is that his excessive use of tears has made him sterile and he now seeks an heir. And what better heir than himself from another universe? A group of Elizabeths gather around Booker and drown him, causing them to disappear. He's Zachary Comstock. He's Booker DeWitt. No. I'm both. The post credit scene has Booker back in his office, seeing if Anna is there in the crib. So yeah, this ending, where to start? I do have to give credit that's very much a visual treat, especially walking amongst the lighthouses and the baptism scene. Let's look at a few things here. Firstly, Elizabeth drowning Booker, and as a result, Comstock never exists. Therefore, this Elizabeth doesn't exist as well. So there is a time paradox. But with the idea of infinity, that shouldn't matter. There is no limit. There is no end, not a million million worlds like Elizabeth says. There's no limit to universes of where Booker exists and Comstock exists, where Columbia does and Columbia doesn't. While it's just theorized by the Lutesses, the fact that Anna lost her pinky in a different reality has led her powers is a bit of an odd stretch. But beyond all that, what exactly is the ending trying to say here? Constants and variables? Cycles? We did see a bit in Columbia itself of the differences and similarities between Comstock and Fitzroy. Meet the new boss, same as the old. Is this ending also saying nothing really matters at the end? Is this making meta-commentary on choices in games? The story once again writes itself into a corner here, and trying to wrap it up, it throws all these things at you. So one thing I remember seeing after release, and even to this day, although in much smaller numbers, is, well, you didn't like the ending because you just didn't get it. On launch, with all the hype, there were those who said it was incredibly complex, mind-blowing, and you have to be smart to understand it. Beyond that hype, once you get past the visual treat that is this ending, stop to think about it for a moment, it utterly falls apart. Just because the game tosses playing your face with infinite universes and comes across as complex, that doesn't make it good. And even when you write it down on a sheet of paper of how many universes you've traveled through, it's not that difficult to follow. Earlier I mentioned that the game should have kept the tears and universes to something you could pull from, but not go through. The game could dig more into other things they touched upon, but get swept away in the second half. Columbia, Comstock, the Vox Populi. You could continue with the more personal story of the second half, but still keep the city the main focus, just like it was the case for Rapture. Instead of devoting all this time to multiple universes, constants, and variables, you could focus on what was most interesting about Bioshock Infinite, the city of Columbia itself. On the note of characters, I have mixed feelings about Booker also being Comstock and the father of Elizabeth. Can't help but feel that Ken Levine has what I refer to as M. Night Shyamalan syndrome. He's been known for plot twists in the past, so now there's pressure for him to keep doing so. Spoilers here for System Shock 2 and Bioshock, although I'm sure you played them. System Shock 2, of course, the revelation of Shodan, and Bioshock, the truth about Jack and Atlas. When you're also known for plot twists, players are always going to be on guard and vigilant about them. You could have had something along the lines of Comstock being his own character. Perhaps he was at the same baptism as well with Booker, seeking forgiveness for Wounded Knee. Unlike Booker, he goes through with it, while Booker turns away and continues to carry his sins. 
Legends. Having Elizabeth be the daughter of Comstock, who is not Booker, the story could have worked just as well. Bioshock Infinite tries to come across as clever with these concepts here, but unlike the first Bioshock, with its cleverness, it's disjointed from the rest of the game. There are interesting ideas you could take with Terrors and applying them to the story of Columbia. Done right, it could be a great complement to the story. However, it shifts to become the focus, and for me, it was never as interesting as Columbia itself. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned there was a number of things done in Infinite that were done better in Bioshock 2. Let's explore that. Spoilers for Bioshock 2 if you haven't played it, which I highly recommend. After all, it is my favorite of the series. I've been happy to see Bioshock 2 over the years receive a resurgence in how it's viewed. My video on it has been one of the better performing videos on this channel. It's a game that didn't seem to really need a sequel, but the material it covers more than justified its existence. Now I'm totally fine for those who prefer the first game overall. After all, the poll I ran had that win by a wide margin. It's when those who prefer Infinite over 2 is where I get more curious about. When you take a closer look at these two titles, there's quite a number of similarities here in regards to the plot. Here are some of the major ones. Our main goal is to find the girl, in both cases are the main character's daughter. Although in Bioshock 2, it's the big daddy, little sister relationship with Eleanor. Fun fact though, there's two bits of cut dialogue with Eleanor. One staying that subject Delta is their father, and another case in which he's not. Both Eleanor and Elizabeth are being raised in the way of being the future saviors of their respective city. A cult is being built around them and are given great power. While Ken Levine didn't work on Bioshock 2, its director Jordan Thomas would join the Bioshock Infinite team in later stages of development. So who knows how much that had an impact here on Infinite. Back in my Bioshock 2 video, I mentioned how Bioshock 2 was ahead of the curve when it came to the AAA dad simulator games that popped up around Infinite. In Infinite, we spend our time with a mostly upbeat woman in the mold of the Disney princess trope. She'll toss us supplies and pick locks, and she can't be hurt in combat. She's a constant companion. In Bioshock 2, Eleanor is away from us for most of the game, but she contacts us throughout. Instead, our relationship is built vicariously through the little sisters. We could get them to harvest Adam, but we need to protect them. Depending on how we deal Deal with the little sisters and a few key choices along the way, Eleanor will react accordingly, resulting in a number of different endings. So while as good as Bioshock Infinite does here with Elizabeth, Bioshock 2 does a much better job with merging the narrative and the gameplay on this relationship, so that's why I give it the edge. I always felt that the big daddy little sister relationship was the most interesting aspect of Bioshock. Bioshock 2, we got to explore that more from the perspective of a big daddy. Bioshock 2 works better as well with its focus on tugging at your heartstrings. Bioshock 1 was mostly focused focused on messing with your head. Bioshock Infinite tries to do both. And this is where the game stumbles. The idea with infinite universes and terrors and the attempt to mess with your mind simply creates a jumbled mess. They focus more on the city of Columbia and on the relationship between Booker and Elizabeth. They could have achieved this. And while there are great moments throughout Bioshock Infinite and many visual treats, none of them match have the impact on me like the scene in Bioshock 2 where you take control of a little sister, where you guys see how they view Rapture. This may very well be my favorite moment in Bioshock as a series. There is nothing in Bioshock Infinite that also hit the same level of the story of Mark Meltzer, a man who had his daughter taken away from the surface to be used as a little sister. Through sheer determination, he discovers Rapture and went to find his daughter. When he discovers that she's now a little sister and he's captured, he accepts the fate of becoming a big daddy to be with her. You could piece together this story through audio logs and your encounter with him later in the game. It's an incredibly tragic story that's told through a great combination of narrative and gameplay. Nothing in Bioshock Infinite is able to come close to hitting the marks of these moments from Bioshock 2. Now, by no means is Bioshock 2 without flaws. The first level doesn't get the game off on the greatest foot. Sophia Lamb is as compelling as Andrew Ryan. But the improved combat, the simple but emotional story, and a well-executed blending of narrative and gameplay Bioshock 2 is able to accomplish what Bioshock Infinite tried to do and failed. And from what was shown and shared with the public prior to launch, Bioshock Infinite could very well reach the same level, and even exceeded it. So, what happened during the development of Bioshock Infinite? I've mentioned this throughout the video at various points on things that were cut from Bioshock Infinite and its troubled development. And of course, this is common for games. It's common to go through a few iterations before settling on something. The first Bioshock had a few setting changes before they settled on Rapture. Resident Evil 4, one of my favorite games, went through a number of different iterations prior to release. There's always that what-if aspect to a 
game if it came out differently. A forbidden fruit, if you will. Bioshock Infinite is a fascinating case on this front. One team member said they had enough content to cut five to six games. There was so much shown or talked about prior to release that never even made the cut or was greatly scaled down. The bit of research I've been able to put some of these puzzle pieces together and what happened during development. I'll summarize the key points here. Starting development shortly after Bioshock launched, the team had freedom from Publishers 2K to do what they wanted. This gave them time to experiment and work without worrying about deadlines or budgets. The demonstrations of Bioshock Infinite in 2010 and 2011, while highly praised, were scripted down to the smallest detail. They were hoping to deliver on that vision, but they weren't able to reach it. There was a multiplayer mode that 2K won that took up development time before it was cut. This was decided when Jordan Thomas, director of Bioshock 2, joined in January of 2012. Throughout development, especially later on, a number of senior staff left the project. Those interviewed talked about the frustrations of working under Ken Levine, who was always changing and iterating the vision. For example, Shantytown was initially inspired to look more like the slums of Jamaica and Key West. After many months, Ken changed his mind on how it looked. Art director Nate Wells, a longtime rational employee, left as a result. A year prior to release, Don Roy, a veteran game producer, was hired. He had plenty of experience in closing out games and getting them shipped. However, at this point, there was still no playable build for the game. In August of 2012, Rod Ferguson was brought in from Epic Games. Rod also had a reputation of being a closer. He's there to help make cuts and get the game out the door. Employees interviewed mentioned that without Rod, the game would have not shipped. Rod put deadlines into place, which staff mentioned greatly helped Levine now that he was working with constraints. With heads down, the game would be cut down to what was finally released. Fast forward ahead after the release of Burial at Sea DLCs, on February 18th, 2014, Ken announces that the studio will be shutting down, with all of about 15 staff members. The studio would then become Ghost Story Games, a subsidiary under Take Two. And since the nearly eight years as of writing the script, there's been peeps here and there about what they're working on, but nothing has been shown. At the beginning of 2022, shortly before I fired up Infinite to start getting footage for this video, an article came out talking about Ghost Story Games and development hell. There's plenty of patterns that emerge here in the development as was the case of Bioshock Infinite. Here's a few notable bits from this article that I came across. Surprise, surprise, there's been a number of reboots and shifts in direction. May have said that you either love or hate working with Ken. He could be incredibly frustrating with his constant changes in direction, but some of their best works have come about from it. Like Bioshock Infinite, they've had the time to do what they want, and with a much smaller team, Ken mentioned that their studio is a rounding error for Take Two. Very little has been said on what they're working on. Ken Levine has mentioned the premise of what has been referred to as Narrative Lego. This would be a game where characters would react differently depending on player actions. This is a stark contrast to his more cinematic approach in the past. They were hoping to ship something in the fall of 2017. And despite the small team size, Ken was still shooting for something as large and ambitious as Bioshock. It would be common for Ken to play a game and want to have that feature implemented. Something that sounds a lot like George Brassard in regards to Duke Nukem Forever. While it's not the length of Duke Nukem Forever's development, it's been around seven and a half years of work on this untitled game. Some former employees predict it could still be a couple of years away. There are a couple of quotes from Ken himself I came across that help enlighten some aspects into what's happening at Ghost Story. When talking about his process, Ken said the following, In almost every game I've worked on, you realize you're running out of time and then you make the game. You sort of dick around for years and then you're like, oh my god, we're almost out of time, and it forces you to make these decisions. In an article with Rolling Stone, Ken said, if I could still get paid, I would make games and never ship them. I don't enjoy shipping games, I find it kind of dreadful. The real warm experience is being with the team and making it. And that quote has really stood out to me. Now he's running a small team, he's getting paid, and he has far more time to make games and never ship them. He's also been in this situation before. There was a game that Irrational worked on called The Lost that was made after System Shock 2. Best comparison would be the American McGee's Alice games. However, with the game more or less done, they decided to shelve the game, thinking it would hurt their reputation. That said, the game did eventually come out, but that story opens up a whole different can of worms. If you're interested, I did a whole video on The Lost that you could check out to learn more about it. Now, back to being paid to work on games and not shipping them. This can be fine for Ken, who could get away with this. He has the name backing and recognition. However, several staff have left because of the issues with constant changes, lack of deadlines or structures, or the fact that they couldn't just spend years working on something without shipping. Some could find themselves in situations where if they're looking for employment elsewhere, they couldn't show what they've been working on for the last few years due to their employer agreement. Now, I do respect Ken and his work. In the industry, he's been given a luxury that very few have been given. It's very much a case of, here's your deadline, now get it out, with games being rushed out months or even years before they should have been released. On the other side of the coin, issues can arise when you don't have 
have any set deadlines or schedules. Bringing up that Orson Welles quote again, the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. System Shock 2 was made under the gun in a short time frame. Bioshock had much more flexibility, but still had looming deadlines. About half a year before launching, Bioshock had a disastrous playtest session that caused them a reworks to be done. Bioshock Infinite? There were no worries for a good stretch of development in regards to looming deadlines. So much so, they came up with so much material, which a lot of it had to be discarded or greatly reduced. The same case seems to be happening with what they're working on at Ghost Story Games. I wouldn't be surprised if at some point Take-Two says, you got a year, think about what you want to ship. In that case, we'll end up with a release that will likely be interesting, but far removed from what they had in mind. And perhaps that's also why they're being so quiet with showing it. Bioshock Infinite was shown to the public around two and a half years prior to launch. So who knows about this? While I am curious to see what they have come up with, I'm keeping my expectations in check, and so should you. And who knows, maybe we'll never see anything at all. So, wrapping all this up, how do I feel about Bioshock Infinite? After all, this is my first time revisiting games since Burial at Sea releases in 2014, and at that time I had very mixed feelings. Revisiting Infinite, I did find myself enjoying it more than I thought I would. However, it's still very much several steps back from Bioshock 1 and 2 and is a disappointment. Columbia is an incredibly realized world, but sadly gets mostly pushed away in the second half. The relationship between Booker and Elizabeth is great. However, her being a non-factor gameplay-wise beyond tossing us supplies is a disappointment. Combat is streamlined with its approach to weapons and vigors. There's no systems in place that compare to the Big Daddy Little Sister system from past titles. The story is a jumbled mess of ideas that tries to make itself look more deep and complex than it really is. There are plenty of overlaps in some of the ideas here that were present in Bioshock 2. Here, they are bombastic but disjointed. In Bioshock 2, they were understated with great blending of the narrative and gameplay. I still found it enjoyable, but it's still a disappointment and the worst in the series. With how much was shown and talked about prior to launch, and what the end product ended up being, it's on the more interesting what-ifs in gaming, and a great case of wasted potential. Now, I know Infinite does have its fans, with some finding it to be the best in the series, and that's fine. However, I do encourage you to revisit the game if you haven't done so in a while. Or better yet, just go play Bioshock 2 and instead. Plus, with all the rumors about it, we're very likely going to get some concrete information about Bioshock 4 this year. Not a bad time to revisit these titles. And we're still not done here. I've only covered Infinite. I'll be covering the Burial at Sea DLCs at a later date. That's a whole other can of worms to dissect through. Well, you gotta name this. Elizabeth. You can call me Elizabeth. Thanks everyone for enjoying. If you made it this far, please consider supporting my Patreon. There you get access to videos like this sooner, you'll get weekly updates about what I'm working on, you'll appear in the credits here. And if you made it all this way and you haven't liked or subscribed, you know that whole shebang, please do so as well. Thanks everyone. Boulder Punch out. Hey,